pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Sh uh, Sean Lensman. Uh, Sean is an instructor at uh, Carleton University. He did his undergraduate degree at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It's a very well-known university. Did his MSc at Carleton University. I've always wanted to ask you about this, uh, how you ended up at these places another time. <laughs> and a PhD at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, his research focus, as will become evident, I suspect, has been in fishery science, um, but his interests have really greatly expanded to include the practice and communication of science. So if you checked out his website, um, you will know that. Um, but he's also a wonderful freelance photographer and writer, and he's published in venues like National Geographic, CBC, and Saltscapes. Um, what I really like from your website, though, is your list of hobbies and things. So I'm going to read a few of them. <laughs> So craft beer, I suspect many of us can get into that. Cats, and this is all capitalized, and dogs. Uh, chocolate chip cookies. Uh, scuba diving, sports fishing, which is not uh, surprising. Coffee, repeated three times. <laughs> but the thing that I liked most was holding doors for people. And then it says that it's literally on my business card. It is literally on my business card. But it also bespeaks a, a kind person. Um, anyway, I've, I've very much been looking forward to this and, and the title of Sean's talk is just up there. So thanks very much. Sean. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. This is very weird for me to be here today because I think the last time I was here was in 2010. Um, and I was just sitting in the audience watching uh, watching these talks. So now to be able to be on the other side of this table giving a talk uh, is pretty special. Um, thanks, Steve, for the for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, a an issue that I feel particularly passionate about, and I hope that that comes out in in the talk today. Um, but my hope is is that uh, it's not just one great big rant, but is also entertaining as well. But also that you walk away, um, you know, appreciating that we really should be shouting from the rooftops about how wonderful our freshwater resources are, not just fisheries, um, but all of our freshwater resources, uh, super, super special. So I hope that's uh, something you're able to walk away with uh, from today. Um, so Steve gave me a great introduction. I had a couple of other things I was going to uh, mention here, specifically that I was a field tech here at, at Cubes uh, from 2006 to 2009, and I even met my wife now wife here at cubes and she's sitting in the corner right there yeah um yeah i uh so i'm a trained fisheries ecologist i now teach at carlton i teach fisheries science classes but i teach a lot of interdisciplinary science as well including science communication so um, I really became interested in science communication during my master's um, when I was working with muskies, and I still work quite a bit uh, with muskies, but I became really interested in, in communicating science during my master's. I felt it was important that I try to connect the science to the general public, um, which is a term in science communication that that some people um, kind of might furrow their brow at a little bit because there's many different sort of subsets of the public. In this case, I was working really heavily with the angling public. And so I wanted to make sure that the science that um, was of interest to them was accessible. And so I just, uh, I, I put together a blog uh, during my master's and put up posts almost every day. So it was like an almost a near real time um, kind of documentation of uh, of my field work, including all the nitty gritty, all the trials and tribulations. Um, so that was what really got uh, me interested in, in science communication. So I know I see, I think a lot of students in the room here, if you have a passion uh, to communicate science, you should follow that and try and find any little avenue, any little opportunity to do that because you, you you don't know where that might might take you. Um, as a field tech, I had one of those little point and shoot cameras that can go about 10 feet under the water before you go any deeper than that and you risk flooding the camera. Um, and I loved taking pictures underwater when I was here at Cubes. I'm from Illinois and we don't have 
particularly clear water. And so to come up to Opinicon and the water is very clear and we went into some of the back lakes like Long Lake, um, which had really good clarity. Um, it's actually where that bass came from. Um, it was pretty special to be able to take my camera underwater, but you know, there's limitations with those little cameras. And so over time, I was kind of waning a little bit on, on photography and eventually came back to it in 2011. It wasn't until 2015 that I ended up getting a, uh, a, a an actual housing for a proper DSLR camera. And so I'll, I'll talk in depth about that uh, more later. Um, all right, so let's get into the kind of crux of my presentation today. So I'm going to turn it back on all of you. When I say freshwater, what comes to mind? And I'll just take volunteers and it could be something like a story. It could be one word, um, anything you maybe associate with freshwater. What comes to mind? What's that? No salt. No salt. Yeah, yeah. Lakes. What else? Streams, okay, good. Paddling, what else? Drinkable, yeah, I was gonna point over at the water bottle there, yeah. Anything else? Rare, rare? yeah, increasingly rare. I was just reading an article in about rural Californians that are have experienced a multi-year drought. Um, certainly there's been issues in South Africa, uh, yeah. Definitely, that's a good one. What else? Life giving. I, you know, I'm going to stop right there because really, freshwater is absolutely critical. It's like, are you looking at my computer? Which freshwater is truly critical to our lives. Um, we need it for drinking. Um, we need it for sanitation, food production, uh, power generation, which is itself kind of controversial. Uh, manufacturing, there's a whole host of services that freshwater itself provides us. And we haven't even talked about the ecosystem services it provides, but needless to say, freshwater is absolutely critical to our existence. Uh, this is, I'm getting into some territory here that to me, when I you start thinking about um, the scarcity, the rarity of freshwater, and yet the amount of biodiversity that's in freshwater, to me, it gets truly uh, astounding. So the percentage of, of water that covers our surface is about 70%. And then of that, we've got about 2.5% that's freshwater. Of that 2.5%, um, only about 1% of it or a little bit less is actually available. So most of it is locked up in groundwater or polar ice caps. Um, it's not really available to life on Earth. And even though freshwater itself covers about 1% of Earth's surface, it holds more than 10% of all known species, which itself is truly mind blowing, something like 126,000 species. It's also home to about one third of all known vertebrates, charismatic megafauna like these two, the American alligator, the Amazon River Dolphin. To a fish lover though, it's truly special because it's home to more than 50% of all known fish species. I mean, stop to think about that for a second. The relative scarcity of fresh water on Earth and yet holds more than 50% of all known fish species. Think about how vast the oceans are. However, there's a big but to all this, that there is a strong bias, a, a, a demonstrated strong bias against freshwater research and funding relative to terrestrial and marine ecosystems. And we could probably have a long conversation about why that might be. And there are some uh, distinct reasons for that. But yeah, despite their importance, freshwater ecosystems and their in inhabitants don't really get the amount of research attention that a lot of other uh, species do and a lot of other ecosystems do. For freshwater ecosystems, the default has been if we take care of the land, we'll also take care of the freshwater ecosystems themselves. 
Um, in other words, that um, terrestrial environments essentially become surrogates for the freshwater environments. And to an extent, that is a valid approach in some instances, but time and time again, what we see are these huge spatial scales that, uh, uh, that, that freshwater ecosystems are affected on, right? So these large watersheds, and so there might be, you know, things that happen in this relatively small corridor along certain sections of a river, for example, if you protect that riparian zone, riparian corridor, that's great. And you might be doing a benefit, you know, in that immediate and immediate surrounding there in the freshwater system. But when we go way back and we go way into the land, it becomes much harder to control what's going on in those areas uh, than right along the river course. So it's much it's much easier said than done, I guess, um, to protect the terrestrial habitats such that they do an effective job at protecting freshwater. So time and time again, that approach just doesn't work. It also ignores the very uniqueness of freshwater ecosystems. Freshwater and aquatic environments have very different, in many cases, very different um, needs and requirements that the terrestrial environments don't necessarily have. Okay, so there's been this um, uh, needs to change, and I'll come back to this, this point later. And to also underscore how left out or forgotten um, a lot of freshwater ecosystems are. Um, this is the, th there's a draft, this is publicly available, a uh, draft framework for the Convention on Biological D uh, Diversity, which is something that the UN puts out. Um, it's almost like a treaty that governments, uh, that governments sign in order pr to protect biodiversity. And in the latest draft, um, Freshwater was not even included anywhere in the document. So the original draft left freshwater completely out of the equation. All that was mentioned in terms of, of managing ecosystems and managing biodiversity within ecosystems was land and sea. There was no recognition of freshwater anywhere in the document. And so some of my colleagues uh, and I um, signed a petition to get the UN uh, Convention on Biological, Biological Diversity to put in, explicitly put in their biodiversity framework, mention of land, freshwater, and sea. And, you know, it was the case of push come, when push comes to shove, they will actually do something. And so, again, this is the kind of battle that freshwater conservationists are having to face when we're trying to make substantive, substantive change to how these systems are managed and, and how we conserve biodiversity in these systems. Well, I had the song to this, but uh, for some of you, you might recognize who that is. Cue the, the Simple Mind song. So I'll go through a, a couple of, um, uh, of statistics here just to, again, help illustrate that there really is a freshwater biodiversity crisis on our hands. That since 1970, there's been about an 84% reduction in freshwater biodiversity globally, 84%. About one third of all freshwater fishes are threatened with extinction. And this you know, goes from the little bait fishes, the little forage fishes um, that so many of us um, just forget about, um, all the way up to these giant uh, megafauna and some of those species like the white the white sturgeon there which we've got in BC on the west coast um, almost 80 percent um, sorry almost 90 percent of those populations of freshwater large freshwater migratory species um, have been reduced uh, migratory freshwater fishes in general have seen population reductions globally of about uh, 80 percent almost 80 percent um, so it's a, it's a real, real serious problem. Okay, let's transition a little bit. When you see this photo, what emotions does that conjure up? Sorry if that's, you can't see that down there. What emotions does this photo conjure up? Do another audience participation thing. For context, this is the, does anyone know where this is? Someone might actually know where that is. It's most like one of the most 
famous coral reefs in the world. Yeah, Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. What does that conjure up? Despair. Leaching, okay. Fear that it's going to go away. I was taking this in a slightly different route than I was thinking. <laughs> That's okay, we'll roll with it. We'll roll. Huh? Curiosity. Cool. What else? Awe, okay. Anything else? Does anyone want to go jump in that water? Would anyone say this looks beautiful? I guess, kind of, maybe. Okay. What if I put that up there? I hear laughing. I hear chuffing. Why? Why the laughing? What's the contrast there? What do you think? Yeah. What else? Uninviting. Uninviting. Yeah. We have a sediment problem. There's a sediment problem there, isn't there? Maybe we should manage the land better. Anything else? Maybe not great to swim in, not particularly inviting. There's the sediment problem. This is the Mekong giant catfish, and it lives there. This is the giant freshwater stingray, and it lives there. While that might look particularly uninviting, not pleasant to swim in, um, maybe doesn't conjure up as you know, pretty an image as that, or doesn't display itself as pretty as that. It's still home to some truly spectacular animals. And, you know, when you look at an image like this, this is one of the, this is one of the difficulties with getting people to connect to something like that. It's a little easier to connect to something like that. But it's a lot harder, I think, for the public to connect to something that looks like that. It's not particularly inviting. If you were to stand on the shores of that of the Mekong River there and look down into the water, you probably wouldn't be able to see, you know, more than a few inches, if that. Right. So it means then that the biodiversity within that system is perhaps a bit inaccessible to the average person, but yet still has fish like this, the Mekong giant catfish. This is the, this is the world's largest freshwater fish by weight. And this is a close second, third. I'm not quite sure where this is on the list, but the giant freshwater stingray is, is massive. Um, the Mekong River itself is, and this is in Southeast Asia. If you're not familiar with where the Mekong is, it spans multiple countries in Southeast Asia. It's a huge river system. And because it's a big river system, it's also a system that people have um, eyed as a, a good candidate for hydropower generation. And so the river itself is facing a number of very imminent threats to it, primarily from uh, large hydropower operations that are set to uh, to go um, to, to be constructed on the river itself and thus uh, disturb uh, and impede the migrations of large fish like the stingray here uh, and the, the Mekong giant catfish. And really the Mekong is kind of a, um, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, reflective of a lot of other systems on Earth that are being impacted by all sorts of things, many of which are impacted by hydropower dams or other small obstacles. You know, a, a, a dam doesn't have to be 100 feet high. It can still be on 
Prince Edward Island where I did my PhD, a three foot high dam. I mean, we have like 800 impoundments on PEI. An impoundment is created by a dam. Well, most of them are that big. You know, each time there's a dam there and a fish is trying to swim upstream, it, uh, it gets um, uh, blocked from, from completing its life cycle. There are um, four kind of major issues that my colleagues and I um, have, uh, have, have pinpointed as likely culprits, at, at, least, at least in large part, um, culprits in, in large parts of the, the biodiversity reduction. Um, I mentioned earlier the freshwater conservation is, is linked with terrestrial conservation. Um, freshwater resources are viewed as something to, mm, I should actually say exploit. Um, explorer too, sure, great, but also actually exploit. So, so for example, hydropower generation, we're gonna harness the power of, the, of that river in order to generate power or harvesting fisheries resources themselves to, to, to feed people, to feed the masses. Um, freshwater biodiversity is considered invisible and inaccessible. And that's where people like, like me with armed with this can help to, to turn the tide. Um, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And there's also this perception that freshwater life is uncharismatic, meaning, you know, it's hard for us to relate to. We don't think of freshwater uh, creatures as particularly attractive to look at, cute, cuddly. Um, you know, whereas you get pandas and lions and tigers and bears and whales and dolphins, those would be kind of your charismatic uh, megafauna um, that receives so much attention. Really what this comes down to from unlinking freshwater conservation with terrestrial conservation um, through, you know, to, to getting people to stop thinking that freshwater resources are just something to exploit, you know, down to recognize, having the public recognize that much of freshwater life is actually fairly charismatic if we stop to, to, uh, to look at them and, and, and be receptive of that. What we really need to do though, is we need to establish a connection. And I think if we can establish a connection, and this is where I get up on my soapbox, if we can establish a connection among the public and perhaps even most importantly, policymakers, the people that actually write laws and, and get things and protections on the book, I think if we are able to do that, we can really start to address those four major, major issues facing freshwater biodiversity. And to me, this is where visual storytelling really has, has a place in this entire conversation. By building connection, we foster empathy. And it's really apathy that's freshwater's worst enemy. If we just continue to treat freshwater the way we've treated it for decades and decades, and we don't see it as having much value, because we don't have a connection with it, because we can't empathize with, you know, the creatures that swim in, in the waterways, if we can't, you know, find some connection somehow, um, then we, we risk losing these environments and that diversity altogether. So how do we establish that connection? Uh, to me, a, a, big, a big thing that I think we can do better is making freshwater stories mainstream. There was an article published in, I believe it was, yeah, it was 2008, um, by Jeremy Monroe and, and some of these other folks there. And Jeremy now runs uh, Freshwaters Illustrated. If you get a chance at the after the presentation today, take a look at the website, Freshwaters Illustrated. You, you can find them on Instagram as well. Jeremy and his, uh, his, his director of photography, Dave uh, Harazmachuk, and others on his team, all they do is produce video content about freshwater biodiversity. They do a lot of fish, but they do lots on, on, um, on, on, on amphibians and reptiles. Um, they, they do a lot on, on, on insects as well. Essentially anything that swims and calls freshwater ecosystems home, they will try and cover. And in this article published in Fisheries Magazine in 08, you know, Jeremy and his colleagues basically said, 
we need to find a way to get through to the public to get through to policymakers, to make people care about these environments because we're losing creatures fast, really fast. And Jeremy um, and his colleagues there, you know, they advocated that we, we turn to visual storytelling. And, you know, here I am today talking about this. But one of the pleas that they made in their, in their paper was that we really need to see more representation in the media about freshwater. When I was making this presentation, I, I just got curious and I have a subscription to National Geographic um, and you can go into their archives and you can look at all their all their old uh, magazine issues. I don't know if it's all of them, um, but it's uh, it's a lot. And I just looked at the last 10 years to see if freshwater anything was represented on the cover. I didn't dive into the table of contents, just on the cover. And so this was the breakdown. So what I'm showing here is, is covers. I'm talking about covers here that feature some sort of wildlife and I'm including dinosaurs in this as well. Essentially what you see in this list here is we have one mention of anything related to freshwater. In this case, it's you know whole, a whole system, um, an entire watershed, the Great Lakes watershed. Um, no, no, uh, no freshwater biota to speak of graced the cover of National Geographic North America. There are a bunch of different offshoots. I was just looking at North America. Uh, does anyone know Joel Sartori's photo arc? Anyone familiar with that? I see some people nodding their heads. So Joel Sartori is a, a, a very famous photographer that shoots for National Geographic. He has a project called the photo arc where he goes around the world. Um, to zoos and other maybe captive breeding facilities, things like that, where he's trying to photograph every animal in captivity uh, on Earth. That's his whole whole idea there. And he does lots with fish, um, but when push came to shove and National Geographic wanted to put together a cover story um, about the photo arc, uh, they had their choice. This is on their website, you know, let, let's choose among these 10 um, these were our 10 choices for cover designs and only one of them showcased any kind of freshwater animal, any kind of freshwater creature. I think it was a snake neck turtle. Um, it was this one of the lemur that made the cover. Okay, so very, very little representation. As a small tangent, one of the other groups of creatures uh, that that doesn't receive a lot of attention in the media and in research and funding tends to be uh, insects. And yet we see insects also being featured on the cover as well. So, you know, fish and freshwater have some catching up to do. But you can see that it's uh, mostly mammals uh, that were gracing the cover if there were wildlife featured on the cover. So in 10 years, National Geographic published only two high profile anything. So I ended up going in uh, and taking a look a little more closely. Um, any, just anything uh, in their North American print magazine. So they had one you know, excellent feature story on the Great Lakes a couple of years ago. And then Dave Harazmachuk from Freshwaters Illustrated, who's, I, I consider him to be the world's greatest freshwater uh, underwater photographer. Um, had a series of photos of, of freshwater uh, biota that were published in the uh, in National Geographic. Now, part of the problem is that editors of magazines, editors in different um, media companies, like a news uh, like a news outlet, um, editors act as gatekeepers. Uh, I don't know how familiar some of you are with the journalism industry. Um, but the journalism industry is a business after all. Magazines are, are a business. Um, magazine production is a business. So just by their very job duties, editors act as gatekeepers in terms of what information actually makes it out to the public. So as a freelancer, I might pitch an idea for a particular article um, to an editor, and that editor basically has the veto power, right? They can say there's no obligation to publish what I send them, 
uh, even if I create an entire article on what's called spec or speculation and send that to them, I might have spent 25 hours working on this uh, on this article. They're under no obligation to publish that, right? If I gave give them the great the world's greatest pitch, complete with photos and everything, they're under no obligation to publish that. What they really have to do as editors, part of their job duty is to understand their readership, their audience, and choose accordingly, choose content to publish that gets people to keep returning back to their publications. So editors really act as gatekeepers, and this is, this is one group within the media industry that I think scientists can try to reach out to a little more effectively in order to change what, what things actually appear uh, in print. And I had an editor tell me, an editor at National Geographic, actually when I was pitching this article um, to them about a new subterranean, this was new a couple of years ago, new subterranean um, snakehead species that was found in India um, after these massive floods uh, were bringing these snakeheads up from their subterranean caves and bringing them up to the surface. And suddenly there were all these weird snakeheads wandering around, swimming around or flopping around or whatever they were doing. And the, uh, the scientists that made the discovery named it after Golem. And I thought that was pretty, you know, pretty cheeky. And I thought, you know, it, th that would be kind of interesting, really cool set of circumstances that brought about this new discovery. Um, perhaps maybe with a with a darker undertone there with perhaps with climate change and and these really extreme rain events that were occurring at the time. Um, but the the answer I got back was pass Fisher a hard sell. As a fish ecologist, I was devastated. <laughs> this was shortly after I had was able to get another uh, another fish article published in National Geographic. So, I was like riding the high and I thought, oh, here's this momentum. Let's go get something else published. Fish are a hard sell. No, thanks. So the question then is, well, why are they a hard sell, right? And this goes back to being, being um, uh, the, this goes back to us really needing to make sure that the public reconnects with these fisheries resources. So as journalism influences the public, so too can the public influence journalism. And um, what I mean by that is, you know, again, as editors acting as gatekeepers in terms of what information makes it to the public, right? So journalists can influence the public and their behaviors and their decision making, but the public can also influence journalists as well, um, in part because if the public is reacting to certain material in certain ways, that sends a message to the editors about what content might be you know, worth publishing in the future. So I see that personally as an opportunity um, to communicate fresh, you know, stories about freshwater, um, freshwater biodiversity and freshwater ecosystems. Because if we can get the public on, on board with that, and we can get the public all jazzed and fired up about freshwater ecosystems and freshwater biodiversity, then that sends a message to the editors that there is appetite for publishing those kinds of stories. What is storytelling and why is it important? So this is our one-year-old daughter here with my father and my father is reading her story. Storytelling is one of the most common forms of information sharing that, that, that exists. It's one of the first kinds of information sharing methods that, that we're exposed to um, in our lives. And storytelling, when scientists and, 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 uh, and scholars of science communication actually look at the utility of storytelling, we see that there's improvements in recall, comprehension, engagement, and interest. Okay, so there's lots of benefits to telling an effective story, to weaving an effective narrative, and that can be done in a number of ways. It can also be done, it can be done in, in, in written form, or it can also be done visually as well. And visual storytelling is just exactly as it sounds. It's, it's storytelling with visuals. 
whether it's still images or you know moving pictures, say in a in a in a video format, or even you know some interesting visual art, sculptures, and and you know an artist's interpretation of something that they then construct. I come at it from that angle um, with my camera. And visual storytelling requires careful planning. It also requires shot lists. So if I'm trying to, to tell a story about something, I'll create a shot list. I have a, a book that I keep at home, which of course I couldn't find um, when I was preparing this talk, but I did find a shot list that I, small shot list that I had on my, on my phone. And this was when I went to uh, an area near Halifax, Nova Scotia to do um, some, some photographing of a glass eel uh, uh, commercial fishery out there. Glass eels are the little juvenile stage of American eels. That's them there. They look like little pieces of vermicelli when you see them. Um, so that ticks off that shot there, macro tank shots with the spotlight. Fish swimming into a fike net, although that's not a fike net, it's just a dip net. A shot deep looking up into a spotlight that's then shining into the water. And so these are all those are eels coming right at swimming right at the camera as they're migrating upstream. Um, and part of this operate well, this whole operation was run by uh, by this um, by this woman. And so and most of her crew is actually um, younger, uh, younger women, which is pretty if you know anything about the commercial fishing industry. Uh, very male centric, um, and so this was this was pretty unique. This was an, a really wonderful operation. It's very cool to experience that. But underwater photography is inherently challenging. Cameras and water don't play nicely. That's not mine. Uh, that was a joke. This was a uh, <laughs> a YouTube video of someone showing you how to clean your camera by dunking it in a bowl of water. Wouldn't recommend that. It's also dark underwater. It's often very murky. And in some cases, especially when you're shooting in rivers, it's also very chaotic. You also have to get really close to your subjects. This is a freshwater blue shark. No, I'm just kidding. It's a blue shark from Rhode Island. Illustrating though how close you really need to get um, in order to get a good clear image. Uh, this is Dave Rasmichuk from Freshwaters Illustrated photographing brook trout. You have to get that close because the, the further away your subject is, you're shooting through all that water. There's all sorts of particulate in the water and the photos don't come out clear. It's technically very challenging if you just look at that and you can feel free to come up after the presentation. I can open up the, the housing and you can see all the engineering that goes into it. But it's technically very challenging and so I'll show you the resulting image here um, from this whole setup, but this is a cam that camera flipped upside down, mounted reverse on a tripod with these two flashes, uh, external flashes coming off the sides. But if you can figure all that out, it's also very, very rewarding. So this was the result of the setup from that that previous image. Um, I set up shortly before nightfall and waited and waited and waited until it was sufficiently dark enough to capture both the stars and the smelt um, swimming in the river. So it's a split shot. Um, it's a it's a double exposure done in camera. So I had to focus for the stars and then take a second frame focused for the fish. Very rewarding when you can pull off an image like that. That took a long time to plan that. Um, that's an alewife swimming through bubbles below a fishway, and so there's actually a story to that too. Imagine being a fish trying to swim through that. It's pretty disorienting, right? Being in an environment like that, um, and uh, when these fish are trying to move upstream, going through fish ladders and things, that's what they have to. That's what they have to deal with, um, and it can be uh, can lead to a lot of fish not actually making it upstream or making it through that that fish ladder. See, I think that's charismatic. I don't know. Maybe I'm weird. I love eels. I think eels are cute. Uh, I think they're super cool. They're really, they're really fairly inquisitive. Smallmouth bass, which we have here in Opinicon, are um, to me super, super inquisitive. Probably one of the most inquisitive fish that I've ever had a chance to swim with. But eels are are a close second. Those are white suckers from a, a small stream in Quebec. 
and brook trout from a, a small river in Maine. More brook trout. These are from Prince Edward Island. Um, that was a female attacking a male who was trying to actually eat her eggs. I had a cam, the camera set up on a tripod laying on the river bottom. I was sitting up on the bank with a piece of string tied to a bicycle brake cable that was then tied to the shutter release mechanism here. And I had a cup of coffee and was nicely bundled up and sitting in my camping chair. And every time the fish would swim in front of it, I would just pull the string and it would trip the trigger, trip, um, trip the shutter. But it was, uh, was the only way I could get that close to these fish because they were in such, such shallow water. So you see, you know, this is only about, well, water line is about there. So maybe six inches of water. Stories can be told through single images or through essays. So I really wanted to illustrate uh, that rainbow smell as they're migrating upstream, have a, have a, a difficult time often getting past uh, things like road culverts and this was actually a bit of what's called a, per a perched culvert where it was just above the water and so it was effectively uh, uh, almost a complete barrier to upstream movement um, and that's just a, a, a screenshot from adobe lightroom showing a photo essay that i was putting together on east coast migratory species so Lots and lots and lots of visual storytelling that goes on about marine ecosystems. There's an entire week of programming on Discovery Channel dedicated to sharks. There have been entire series, uh, high, high, huge budgets, BBC Earth, huge, massive, multi, multi-million dollar budgets um, celebrating our oceans. I think there might be one episode spread across this series, the Blue Planet series, that deals with freshwater, but that's it. Entire production is dedicated to, uh, to whales. And then if anyone is familiar with Jacques Cousteau's work, you might, be, you might recognize that. And Jacques Cousteau, we, what we need in freshwater, we need Jacques Cousteau's in freshwater. We need people that will be willing to brave frigid environments to get in you know to brave attacks by beavers and snapping turtles you know in order to bring back images to the public and that's really what Jacques Cousteau did is he got in the water um, and you know brought brought footage from from the underwater environment in, in the oceans back to the public and that's what we need fortunately things I think are changing, the, the needle is moving. We're not talking major leaps, but the needle is moving. So we, we do have some, uh, some representation uh, in, in large media outlets like National Geographic um, on freshwater fish stories. Um, Hakai Magazine's another one, they're more coastal, but they will also publish um, some, uh, some inland coastal kind of um, fishery stories. Uh, Biographic is another great um, media outlet. Um, California Academy of Sciences puts that out. We see, we've seen an episode uh, on Netflix's Our Planet. Again, I think there's maybe one episode in, in the Blue Planet series. Um, so we are seeing some representation. It's just really, really slow, but, but it is starting to come along. We also have dedicated freshwater storytellers and there are there's lots of us, just not just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the amount of people that dedicate themselves to photographing uh, marine creatures and and taking you know video footage of, of marine creatures. Jenny Adler, um, she shoots, um, specializes in Florida Springs. Uh, Michelle Rogo, um, European freshwater fishes, Jack Perks in the UK, and then the Freshwaters Illustrated fellas. And, you know, I guess I would like to call myself a dedicated freshwater storyteller, so I'd lump myself in with that. So we're out there. We're out there. Um, it's just, you know, trying to break through a lot of the other content that that's really that's really tricky. So what can the average person do in terms of propping up the the image of freshwater uh, of freshwater ecosystems and biota. What we really need to do is normalize conversations about freshwater. We just need to talk about it. We just need to talk about it. We just need to 
talk. We need to talk with the same enthusiasm as we would coral reefs. Okay. We need to share stories about freshwater and encourage publishers to produce more. So when I say share stories, if you come across something that National Geographic puts out or Hakai Magazine or Biographic or something else, share that. Share that with you know folks on social media. Share that with your with your network, um, and encourage publishers to to produce more. You can tag them in in social media posts, whatever. Shout from the rooftops about how awesome freshwater ecosystems are. And again, it's like we need a collective voice here to be to be uh, to be the real cheerleaders for freshwater environments. So I'm gonna leave. You with that, it's an image of spawning brook trout. And it's probably one of my cheekiest images that I always publish on, put out on Valentine's Day every year. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll take questions. Any questions? Yeah. The most savage fish I've ever been that I've ever experienced are bluegill and Lake Opinacon. <laughs> bluegill and bass. Uh, I mentioned smallmouth before. Smallmouth can get really quite aggressive. Um, other than that, not really. American eel are not. I I don't think they have particularly good eyesight, and so. I've been snorkeling in PEI uh, estuaries where there's tall eel grass, and I don't even know that they saw me there, but I've had them occasionally hit hit your legs. But no, nothing, nothing particularly. Um, I mean, when we were in Rhode Island with the blue sharks, they didn't attack, but they came. Uh, I guess they did come up and try and chew on the uh, the the flashes. They didn't. Yeah, they're very curious about those. Yeah. Curious about the consequences of your letter to the UN. Um, yeah. Did you, did you get a response? The petition? petition. Well, they they in the second draft, they did include it. So they they have it in brackets though. So it's land and freshwater, land, freshwater, and sea. Right. So everywhere there was a mention of land and sea, they've now added freshwater, but it's still in brackets. And so we just got an email from. Um, um, from someone at WWF saying, uh, you know, this is still in brackets. So this isn't set in stone. They may have just been doing that to placate us, but the brackets, it, the fact that it's in brackets means they can take it out. It's just there temporarily. So they did do something. Yeah, they did do something. I know that, that Queens, you probably know this, that universities now, if they're not doing well in the international rankings, are going to the SDG. Yeah. 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 Beans has been big on that. Talking to us at Cubes a lot. And then so we looked at life below the surface or whatever it's called at SDG. Yep. And nothing we do in aquatics up here really qualifies because yeah. it's all marine. Right. Like I'm really right. blown away. Right? I know. It's shocking. I just I just don't get it. I, I just don't understand it. Um but I, you know, again, I think. I think that freshwater resources have for so long been just seen as something to exploit and they don't receive much attention and people easily. And when I say people, I, I, I really mean policymakers, people that are actually writing laws that are actually, you know, putting things on the books seem like they're just forgetting about them and it's 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 maddening. But, you know, there is now a really strong vocal you know, part of the the you know the global conservation community that is that is drawing attention to this issue, and so you know when we send a multi-thousand signature petition to uh, to the to the UN there about needing to get fresh water into that biological framework, um, they're listening. So whether you know whether that actually results in something some kind of tangible outcome, I'm not sure, but. Two questions. Um, first one is, how do you respond, or do you kind of get an opportunity to respond when an editor shuts you down like that? 
And then the second kind of question is in in Ottawa, what is it? What is your experience like with policymakers? Because you're right at the heart of any government it extends either locally or kind of federally, essentially. What opportunities have you had within like the policy realm? It's an awesome question. I'll address the second one first, which is that um, that I don't have as much experience working directly with policymakers as some of my counterparts do. So Steve Cook, who does lots of research here, Steve has lots of really good inroads with that takes time to build those relationships. And it's a lot of it's building relationships with the staffers first. Uh, and then you get access to, you know, the people that actually have the ability to put pen to paper. Um, but, you know, some of the staffers are listening, science advisors, you know, that's a, um, actually I was just on a call with Steve today and he was saying that one of the, uh, one of the professions that a lot of grad students are being hired into out of their grad programs is as science advisors to the government. And, you know, if you get the right people in the right places, bending the right ears. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that this will change over time as we get, you know, a, a, gen, a newer generation of, um, of, you know, influential scientists at the government level that will be able to bend the right ears. Um, what was the first question? Oh, uh, responding to editors. Yeah, I, I've never, <laughs> I'm pretty non-confrontational, so I, I, I don't, I don't push it anymore. Um, if any of you are interested in in potentially freelance writing um, or doing freelance photography, uh, really the name of the game is is to just pitch pitch it around. You're lucky if you get any response whatsoever. That's it. I mean, most most will just you'll just never hear it from them ever again. Um, so, but the name of the game in freelancing is to shop it around. So it's it's uh you don't ever take those things personally but yeah any other questions yeah to the issue here with the uh, freshwater biological diversity is also the sort of fragmented nature of, of uh, species at risk of, of management of these resources yeah i mean i think it's fisheries and oceans does it not have sort of purview over a lot of i i don't know <laughs> fisheries and oceans would mostly be marine Some jurisdiction yeah. Yeah. I guess the point is you well, they have a, yeah, right. Right. They're duking it out, and you have binational, they're duking it out. Right. And you have the very fragmented nature of sort of species at risk and aquatic resources, terrestrial resources. Yeah, it is super fragmented. Yeah. Yeah, even at, um, yeah, even, you know, yes, provincial governments have in, in, in Canada have most say over the management of, uh, of of freshwater fish inland. Um, but even within the provincial government, they're usually like, especially the current administration, be, tends to be hands off and allows the, the conservation authority. So it, it gets even more fragmented. And, and that is that is definitely part of the problem. Yeah. And these aren't, you know, these are these are big, you know, these are not easy problems to solve. Um, that take a lot of coordination. It's it's going to take time, and unfortunately, I mean, as you know, I flashed up earlier that uh, eighty four percent of you know bio of freshwater bio biodiversity has declined since nineteen seventy. It's like we don't really have that time. It's just which is really frustrating. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about children. You have to start with them, I think, to build an, an image of fish as being cute, as you say. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, do you have any connections with uh, teachers? Yeah. If there was a fish tank of fresh water in every school, <laughs> it seems to be that would get people talking. Yeah. So Trout Unlimited has a, it's called, I think it's called Trout in the Classroom program where, where kids will raise tr trout and then those trout, then they'll eventually go and stock those trout places. We, yeah, we do all sorts of outreach with kids. Um, we uh, we so Steve Cook and and some of and some of his students have put together like uh, freshwater fisheries curricula 
that uh, the that teachers across multiple grade levels can access and then actually use real data that's been collected by grad students to. So yeah, I, there's you know there's that it's true. I I absolutely agree that the younger generations are really the ones that we need that we need to reach and and it you know it all, it goes it goes you know in, instilling in in the younger generations that that fish are themselves charismatic. You know, that's great too, but but they have to they have to experience it too. And that's, you know, that's a they have to experience fish, you know. So the tanks are great. If you can get them out into, you know, on a field trip and actually handling fish and, you know, that that can be a really lasting, a really lasting memory. Um, my father's actually running fishing clinics for a camp in Ottawa this summer, and I'm going to get the kids and actually get them, you know, to, to do some fisheries sampling and things like that. And so, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And so our our team at, at Carleton um, does a lot of outreach with kids. And, you know, we, I'm involved in a project now too in Northwest Ontario where um, I'm actually working with, a, it's an indigenous community, the Deer Lake First Nation. and um up there they're having issues with the walleye population in deer lake and um you know one of the one of the things that that they tried first was to put in some harvest limits um on the on the fish itself that didn't go over very well with the, with the community and by they i mean the the community had established these these uh, harvest limits some of the community didn't like that, so they they removed those. And well, what are we going to do here? Because we have a problem. And you know, after lots of discussions, um, I guess the the community and, and some of the other champions down in Thunder Bay um, decided that one of the problems is that people have lost a connection with the fish. And so what what's happened is you've had people over time taking a lot of a lot more fish than than they should be. Then, then the system can uh, can can withstand, and so there's now uh, been funding put together and to create a hatchery, a walleye hatchery. And there's a lot of there's a lot to be said about whether we should have fish hatcheries at all. Um, in this instance, one that's run by this First Nation, and hopefully will actually be run by youth, um, and where we all, we'll we'll actually get the youth out to 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 grab the, the fish from the environment and strip the eggs and, and strip the and strip the milk or the sperm and fertilize them and raise them into fry and then the kids will actually be able to put them back into the water. The idea is that you, you target the younger generation and they become champions for that fish. And as they grow up and have kids of their own and instill those values of protecting the fish, that it has this kind of triple trickle down effect within the community itself and then has you know, instills that that connection or or reconnects the community with with the fish through that uh, through that hatchery. So, yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Um, I'm just curious about what's your experience been like going through the freshwater as well as cottages. In, in both of those communities, you have the full spectrum of people. You know, you have some anglers that are really just out there to catch food and, you know, don't particularly care about any other thing, but maybe walleye, you know, maybe maybe one or two species. And so, you know, they don't really care about protections for the, the forage fish that form the base. And and I would say it, it's the same for the for the cottage community too. Some people just care about, you know, their beautiful lawns and they're perfectly manicured and they get rid of all the trees. And, you know, when you sort of try and approach them about maybe you should keep some of those trees there and you know, this stuff comes in the water. Um, or maybe you shouldn't clear away all of the weeds from or the vegetation from around your dock just so you can have a really nice, perfectly clean place to go and swim it falls on deaf ears. But but again, it, there's the whole spectrum. So then you have other people that are out, you know, 
uh, anglers that that are multi-species anglers. And I think the multi-species anglers are probably some of the more progressive, you know, where um, where they they see the they see value across species. They might target, you know, your quote unquote less desirable, quote unquote rough fish species, quote unquote trash. I don't like to use that term, but especially in the states, it's a big term for like uh, gar, uh, sucker, um, those kinds of fish. But you have some people that will target those at very specific times of the year, and then another group of fish becomes available at another time of year, and they target those, and, they, and they're sort of doing it all. And so they see the value of the suckers, and they see the value of like the apex predators like muskies. Um, and you know, again, you'd have the same thing with 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 um, uh, you know those in the cottage community too, people that are really forward thinking about how they manage their land and and you know are really um, vocal and um, and hands on with their local cottage association in terms of you know how how the lake a particular lake might be managed. So it's all over the board. It's really reflective of you know the rest of society. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem.